BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. This episode of Black Box Online Radio is brought to you by Rep Sports and Ray's Energy. Are you a fan of energy drinks, protein shakes, and health foods? Well, I sure am. I use the stuff almost every single day. They sell Ray's Energy products at my local gym, but you can have them shipped to your home. Use the coupon code NED075, that's N-E-D-075, for discounts applied at the checkout. The link is in the description box. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the show. On October 4th of 1969, Diane Linkletter lost her life. Some people believe that she committed suicide by jumping out of a sixth floor apartment window in Hollywood, California, and other people believe that she was thrown to her death as an act of murder, and the perpetrator was none other than the Zodiac Killer. I would invite you guys to write in the comment section what you think happened to Diane, as well as what you think about Robert Linkletter as a Zodiac suspect, Diane's brother. Both Robert and Diane were the children of media legend Art Linkletter, and this is a story that is going to take lots of twists and turns. Firstly, much of this comes from the year 1978, and we're going to be exploring that for a couple of reasons. And I said in this series, I'm also going to be talking about some alternative possibilities about what happened to Diane, first just giving another rest in peace to her, and you'll see that this is listed as part two. However, if you haven't heard part one yet, that's fine, you can keep listening. I always want the multi-part series episodes on this channel to be standing alone, if you will, freestanding, and I hope you will go back and listen to part one at some point, as well as the introductory episode for this series. But I would like to give a shout out to Bill, who posted something on a forum about how May Russell read a letter that she had received from a woman claiming to have identified the Zodiac Killer, and that her show is available on the World Watchers International website. And if anyone would like to hear this full episode, it is at World Watchers Archive. I just did exactly that. I put that into Google. It was the first result that came up, and it was the program from July 14th of 1978. Um, I will give you the notice, though, that the show is divided into two parts there on the World Watchers Archive. The part about the Zodiac Killer is in part one, and you can't really skip around and just listen to the segments that you want. You have to listen to, like, the whole thing. At least I did on my phone using the internet browser. I was using Google Chrome. But that is the episode July 14th, 1978. And it's not only a simple Zodiac Manson connection angle that, all right, a member of the Manson family was also the Zodiac Killer, right? No, not at all. In fact, the link letter connection goes into an aspect that I've never talked about on the channel before, and that is that could Diane Linkletter have been silenced, not only because she knew the identity of the Zodiac Killer, but was she also a witness to the Tate LaBianca murders that occurred in August of 1969? Because so many people point out to the Zodiac's bizarre chronology, the Zodiac's bizarre timeline of activities. The Zodiac committed the first crime at Lake Herman Road 
on December 20th of 1968, the murders of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen, and May Bressel called it the Mount Herman murders, but this, of course, is Lake Herman Road. And then the Zodiac goes silent, cold, disappears for a while, and doesn't resurface until July of 1969 with the murder of Darlene Farron and the shooting of Mike Michaud. That's July. But what happened in August? There is not a Zodiac murder that took place in August, to the best of our knowledge, not in the confirmed crimes. But then you have the murder of Cecilia Shepard in September of 1969. So some people believe that the Tate LaBianca murders that occurred in August of 1969 was somehow Zodiac related. And other people simply believe that the Zodiac didn't want to commit a crime because he didn't want to compete with Charles Manson, or even this is even really before Charles Manson, didn't want to compete with the person who had murdered Sharon Tate, as well as the other people in the house, and then Lino and Rosemary LaBianca on the second night. I mean, at that point, the headlines are saying Sharon Tate and four others were murdered, and they were Wojtek Frakowski, Stephen Parent, Abigail Folger, and Jay Sebring. But was Diane Linkletter actually there? Well, how does her brother become a Zodiac killer suspect? Well, this person who wrote into the show was saying that they knew him personally. They knew that he was someone who was somewhat of a master of disguise. He would alter his appearance a lot. He would wear wigs. He would have all types of hair lengths. Wigs, I guess, were somewhat popular for men in the 1960s because Tex Watson, the person who was convicted for the murder of Sharon Tate, as well as participating in the murders of all the other people in the Tate LaBianca murder cases, was working at a wig shop when he first got to California, and he even attempted to start his own wig business for a while, which wasn't very successful. But um, I talk all about that in my episode on Will You Die For Me? The Tex Watson Story, available here on this channel. I would like to invite you to listen to that one at some point. But this angle with the link letter connection gets bigger. And I'm not going to lie to you guys, I was very curious about starting this series. I really wanted to get some questions answered. But the answers are just leading to more questions, because not only is Diane Linkletter now a possible Zodiac victim, there is another crime that's going to take place called the Oda family murders. Specifically, they believe that one person was targeted named Dr. Oda. In some sources, he's referred to as an optician. In other sources, he's referred to as an eye doctor. And in other sources, he is referred to as an ophthalmological surgeon. Now, the reason why he gets pulled into this is the letter that May Russell is reading off on that show, Dialogue Conspiracy, states that a pair of glasses had been left behind at the Tate House on Cielo Drive when... Sharon and the other people were murdered, and it was unidentified. Who did it belong to? They don't know. And could it possibly have been Robert Linkletters? And did he not only become the Zodiac Killer, but also murder Dr. Oda? Because that could have been the link that could have connected him. Someone who would have had knowledge of his ophthalmological history his optical history. I'm really trying to get my adjectives as close as possible. And that could have been a link to the entire Zodiac Manson connection, and he was silenced, the same way that Diane Linkletter was silenced. And the way that letter on the uh, Dialogue Conspiracy program was structured was that Diane would have had knowledge that her brother was the Zodiac Killer. He's not addressed by his full name. May Russell simply calls him Robert but it's pretty clearly talking about Robert Linkletter saying that he um, had a sister who committed suicide on October 4th of 1969, and this person believes that Robert was responsible for that very reason. Knowledge of the Manson murders, knowledge of the Zodiac murders, and May Brussel was trying to expand upon this by saying that the um, 
elite circles of California created these murderous minds. And I would indeed agree that Robert Linkletter was part of an elite circle, being the son of a media personality. And the subtitle of the book um, that we'll be talking about later is Diane Linkletter, A Princess Wrongly Accused, and that's by Tom Bleeker. Now, I'm going to give you guys what I honestly think. I think the story is getting bigger and bigger, and it's becoming more and more outrageous. There's a big difference between having a Zodiac killer suspect and then believing that they are responsible for a bazillion other crimes. And they're just silencing anybody who could have any type of knowledge. I won't close the door yet on the subject. I will definitely want to know more. But this segment from Dialogue Conspiracy in 1978 also talks about the 1978 Zodiac Killer letter. And I thought that it was very valuable to hear somebody reporting on that in the current day and age. And I've talked about the 1978 letter before on the channel, but May Russell really zoned in on how Dave Toskey was accused of fabricating this letter himself. Dave Toskey, the detective. And he's mentioned in the 1978 letter, it says, that pig Toskey is good. And people thought that was a little bit too complimentary. And this one I found was a little bit more substantial than these wild accusations about trying to pull Robert Linkletter into not only the Zodiac crimes, but also the Manson family murders, as well as the murder of his sister and the Oda murders. But I felt that her um, discussion on Dave Toskey was a little bit more informative because she also brought up the fact that he not only was accused, but he didn't seem to deny that he had written other letters to Columns trying to build up some publicity for himself, and when he was caught doing so, he simply provided the explanation that it was something fun that he was doing for his family about writing things, mentioning Dave Toskey in the news. So, I'm I'm really not sure what to um, what to say about who wrote the 1978 letter. For the longest time, I thought that it was not authentic, but it is very similar to some of the other Zodiac letters. And I was talking about this with Richard Grinnell on the Zodiac Killer channel when we um, appeared there together. And we both pointed out how we had different observations, the punctuation, the word spacing, the penmanship on the word Zodiac. It's either that... Somebody copied the Melvin Belli letter, which was mailed by the Zodiac on December 20th of 1969. It's either if somebody directly imitated that in the 1978 letter, or they were written by the same person. So, I am, I will just leave it at that for now. But May Russell was very hard on Dave Toskey in 1978. However, she did reveal that she obtained this letter accusing Robert Linkletter of being the Zodiac Killer in 1976. And she had had the opportunity once to talk to Dave Toskey. And at that time in 76, she said, he said to her, and this is all hearsay, but they had knowledge of Robert Linkletter as a Zodiac suspect for five years before that. So he was discussed, and she asked the direct question, was Robert Linkletter the son of Art Linkletter and the brother of Diane, ever eliminated, and he said no. So it's a lot more than just some woman wrote into the channel saying that that um, this guy Robert is the Zodiac Killer, and I believe he also committed this crime and that crime, and he's responsible for his sister's death. It appears the police actually thought that he was a real Zodiac Killer suspect. And there's another point that was discussed on Reddit, which was the first place that I saw it, that Robert Linkletter had connections to Lake Tahoe, and that his sister, not Diane, but the other one, had a cabin in that area, and that's where he would go to stay. Well, Lake Tahoe will be very important in the Zodiac Killer mystery because that is the site of the 1970 disappearance of Donna Lass, who disappeared from State Line, Nevada, on September 6th of 1970. But about the Zodiac crimes, is Robert Linkletter actually in San Francisco at all? I mean, he's been placed 
in Hollywood, California. Okay, let's say you can place them in Lake Tahoe in 69 and 70. The Zodiac did not only commit crimes such as murder or maybe arson, if the Kathleen Johns incident is true, but I doubt it. And this, the Zodiac also wrote letters and ciphers. And they know where those were mailed from. Those are mailed from the Bay Area. And in the most recent Zodiac Killer interview with the Experts um, series upload, which you can hear soon, we talked to Druzer, someone from the forum community, and he pointed out that somebody who didn't live in the Bay Area would have to travel hours and hours and hours just to mail a letter. How likely is that? I vote unlikely. Absolutely, I would vote unlikely that someone would be even traveling two hours to the Bay Area just to mail a letter. I don't know about that, as opposed to a resident who was somewhere in the San Francisco Bay Area. Some people are absolutely certain that the Zodiac Killer lived in Vallejo. Other people think that, no, this is some guy who maybe lived in Benicia, or perhaps just a completely different part of the Bay Area altogether, but even Lake Tahoe is too far. To commit a crime, based on the infrequency of Zodiac crimes, 68, 69, maybe 1970, and as I said, they aren't happening every month, only some months of the year, sure, that is how somebody could avoid getting caught, because, well, they don't live in the San Francisco Bay Area, but someone is going to go to that distance just to put something in a mailbox? I have my doubts. But what do you think about um, any type of Zodiac Manson connection? What do you think about an eye doctor being murdered because he could have identified the pair of glasses that were left behind at the um, Sharon Tate house? And I'm going to go back through some of the Tate LaBianca radio program episodes because... They've talked about the glasses in the past, and in a future episode here on this channel, I would like to address that. So, I'm definitely not closing the door on that, and definitely going to be doing an episode devoted to the Oda murders. But, I said I was also going to talk about Diane Linkletter. And, last week I said that there was this suspect in her death named Ed Durston. Tom Bleeker wrote the book, A Princess Wrongly Accused. The full title is Diane Linkletter, A Princess Wrongly Accused. And Tom Bleeker was engaged to Diane for a little while. Diane passed away at the age of 20. And not only had she been married, she had been engaged multiple times. She was engaged to Tom Bleeker when she was 16 years old. And there, after their engagement broke up, she went on to get married. And she still lived at home when she was married. I cite uh, Tom Bleeker's book and all of this, but I also said that there were two people in the Los Angeles area named Ed Durston. One was somebody who worked in show business, and another was someone who worked for a car dealership. The um, Ed Durston from the media was considerably older at the time of Diane's death. Now, on his Wikipedia, Ed Durston, the showman, it says that there are some suspicious deaths that were surrounding his life. And I was like, yeah, go on. But then they say that that might actually be a different guy named Ed Durston who worked at a Los Angeles car dealership who was much younger, 27 years old at the time of Diane Linkletter's death, to be precise. And I was like, we're probably going to get some answers to that question. Absolutely. Yes, Tom Bleeker is um, identifying the Ed Durston in question as the 27-year-old, the younger one. He was the one who was in Diane Linkletter's inner circle. And, you know, Tom Bleeker says he knew Diane Linkletter personally. He was engaged to her. And he states that um, she didn't have a very strong relationship with this Ed Durston, but he does point out that he would have been 27 years old at the time, so that's a guy. As I said, we were going to get some answers to that very quickly. It was a very awkward Wikipedia article that I was reading off in part one about how if if there's just anybody, anybody under the sun or in the darkness, if you're reading someone's Wikipedia and it says, okay, a suspicious death happened involving this person, but it might not actually be him. It might be somebody else who had the same name. Well, 
why are you putting it on light if you don't know who this person was? Um, and it seems like um something that was easy to clear up, but yes, the Ed Durston, uh, who was a or present with Diane Linkletter when she passed away, was the younger one, not this guy who worked in the media business. Okay, then, when Diane Linkletter fell out of the window, some of the people in the nearby vicinity saw this happen, and they didn't even realize that it was a person who went through the window. They thought that this was a prank, that somebody had thrown something out, some type of object. They didn't think that it was a human body. Now, pay attention to that word thrown, because Tom Bleeker wrote into this channel, and he said very clearly his theory is that Ed Durston was responsible for Diane's murder. Not Robert Linkletter, not well, the Zodiac Killer, unless Ed Durston did something else that we don't know about. But that's the ultimate, um, the ultimate answer. Like, was Diane forcibly pushed out the window? I mean, it's going to be a mystery. But I would like to go back to this whole relationship among everyone in the picture, whether it's Tom Bleeker, Diane Linkletter, Ed Durston, or Robert Linkletter, and all the people in the Hollywood Hills. Because when I was reading the book, Diane Linkletter, A Princess Wrongly Accused, I really got the feeling that California in the 1960s was a time when many people were trying to break into show business but they were experiencing also lots of deviant behavior. Like some people really wanted to make it, whether it's the movie and film industry or to make it in the music business, but they're also connected to illegal activities and operations, whether it's the drug trade or maybe even something more sinister because they're just running with different circles. Some people haven't made it yet. And I talked a lot about this when I was doing episodes on George Hill Hodel and some of the stories behind the miniseries I Am the Night. That was a fictional miniseries about the um, family of George Hodel, who goes on to be a suspect in the Black Dahlia murder and the Zodiac Killer crimes as well. But it's just all about how Hollywood has a bunch of secret activities that are going on in the dark. And May Russell was someone who really wanted to zone in on that, the fact that there is that culture of murder that she was referring to about how elite circles do very sinister things and they can get away with it because they have the power. But if we're going to be critical of people, she flat out called Dave Tosti, someone who was someone very just immoral, unethical, and what he would have been doing, writing letters into newspapers trying to make himself into some type of local celebrity, even if he just thought it was a fun thing to do. She just said that's riding off the backs of innocent murdered victims because he rose to prominence because of his involvement in the Zodiac Killer mystery, and real people were murdered. And he is more or less the tip of the iceberg when it comes to people exploiting crimes for fame. She also brought up Vincent Bugliosi, the prosecutor in the Manson case, who went on to co-author the book Helter Skelter, which goes on to become the highest-selling, best-selling true crime book of all time. And she's just like, he he lied, he's a liar, and he did that for fame. And I, 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 I mentioned the Tate LaBianca program briefly. The thesis of that podcast slash radio show is twofold. The first is we might not know everything about what happened with Charles Manson and the Manson family and the Tate LaBianca murders. And the second is, and the host Brian Davis openly said this, to prove that Vincent Bugliosi was more evil than Charles Manson. Because he abused his position as an attorney and a prosecutor and working with the district attorney's office. He abused that. He lied. He fabricated an entire narrative. He went on to write a book that was full of misinformation. And in the new millennium, which we're in now, Tom O'Neill went on to write a book called Chaos, which is talking all about Charles Manson and the CIA. Now, a lot of the things Tom O'Neill was saying in Chaos are just right out of May Russell. 
I really don't know exactly how much of an influence she was on him, but um, his big revelation was that Charles Manson was a CIA informant, not an operative, but an informant, someone who was used to gather information, and the CIA could have been doing experiments with mind control and responses to LSD, and the Manson family ties directly into that. But, you know, it's so much bigger than that, because the more I listen to Mae Russell, the more I see Tom O'Neill's work and this whole thing about the ways that Vincent Bugliosi lied and Again, the stuff we're hearing about in our day and age is the same stuff that was going on in the 1970s, and I'm not saying that Tom O'Neill recycled the narrative. If anything, he investigated it, and certain things turned out to be true. I mean, that's what I personally think happened. I've never talked to Tom O'Neill, but um, he, he, has, he does absolutely fascinating presentations online about chaos and just the Manson family and the whole narrative that we were taught, that we learned about the contemporary understanding of Helter Skelter. But, I mean, I think that there are times, though, when the story is getting even too outrageous for its own good, that Robert Linkletter is just... um this homicidal maniac who is going after not only his own sister, but he's the Zodiac Killer, may have had some role in the Tate LaBianca murders and committed the Oda murders. I mean, it sounds like they're just weaving this wild story and adding on more and more layers to try and make the pieces fit. But we'll keep investigating, and thank you so much for listening to this episode. Please look out for a part three. And... Please uh, just stay tuned to the channel. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And feel free to look at some of those episodes that I recommended, like uh, Will You Die For Me, the Tex Watson story, as well as some of the older black box recordings about George Hodel. I also have a Zodiac Killer episode both about George Hodel. One is about Steve Hodel, his son and his theories, and I did a debunking episode on George Hodel. On the weekends, I do a series called The Debunking Series, where I talk about Zodiac suspects, whom I believe are absolutely not the Zodiac killer, where there's a low probability he's in that one. And I will see you over on Instagram for the bonus podcast. Until next time.